Hi. Everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Now I know it is late in the day. Uh, the jet lag is hitting me hard. Uh, so um, I'm going to try to stay awake for the next hour. But um, seriously, thank you so much for coming at this time. Uh, I don't go to talks at 5 o'clock. That's ridiculous. So um, you're all amazing people. <laughs> um, so today's talk. Um, the, I, I did a talk yesterday. I don't know how many of you were at that one. Uh, but my talk yesterday, uh, I talked about how badly games are selling on Steam. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's obviously a problem. It's been a problem for a long time. Uh, but right now, it's uh, especially a problem. And it's a problem that many more people than ever before are trying to solve themselves. Um, <clears throat> One of, the, one of the numbers in my talk yesterday was that I worked out that roughly just less than 10% of people who are actually releasing games on Steam essentially are actually making enough money from even just the first month of sales to even continue comfortably on making games. Um, I mean, obviously, that doesn't count people who are just kind of doing it as a hobby aside a, 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 a full job, et cetera. But if we're talking about actually being in the business of making games, uh, the vast majority of people aren't able to sustain themselves. Um, but there are ways to get into that top seven. A, 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 a part of the talk I gave yesterday was me essentially saying that, um, yeah, games aren't selling so great on Steam, but when people are doing the legwork and they're making a good game, there are there's still plenty of people out there who are happy to buy games on Steam. Uh, you just need to be putting the right things in place. And I guess by being here at this talk, um, you are probably one of those people who would like to be one of those top 7%. Good for you. Um, so I'm Mike. Uh, I have been um, working in video games for a long time. I used to write about video games. I actually went to uni doing computer science to make video games. And it turned out I was really, really bad at it because I just found it boring. Um, so then I decided I'm just going to berate other people who make them uh, and became uh, like a critic. And um, as part of what I did when I was writing about games, I did a lot. Uh, I, I started writing for places like Gamma Sutra. I started to do a lot of. Uh, talking to developers, working out why their games sold. Then I started to dig into numbers, and I found all of this stuff fascinating for some weird reason, because I'm a lunatic. And, um, and then that sort of led me on to getting hired by uh, the publisher Tiny Build. Um, we did a bunch of stuff there and had some pretty decent success, which kind of uh, backed up my egotistical theories. And uh, then last year, I thought, I can do this myself. It's easy. Uh, decided to um, start my own publishing label, No More Robots, and I've gone gray since then. Um, uh, so uh, it's 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 been going it's been going uh, okay as No More Robots. Uh, I've been using uh, maths, I guess you guys call it math, uh, to um, to work out how to make games sell. Uh, and uh, I released um, our first game last month called Descenders, a downhill mountain biking game from the beautiful people at Rage Squid, uh, a Dutch studio. Um, and, uh, and next week, I'm announcing game number two, um, which is causing me even more stress. Hooray! Um, so uh, here's just some rough idea of why you should remotely care about any of the words I have to say. Um, this is so, so Descenders came out on February 9th. Uh, and since then, the, the game has essentially made more money in its first month than Rage Squid's previous game made in its lifetime, uh, which is, is fantastic for me, because uh, I, 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 love the, I, I love the people I work with. I especially love Rage Squid. And I wanted to secure their futures and just in the first month. Uh, of the game, we have definitely done that, which is absolutely lovely. Uh, and a lot of other people have been very uh, interested in the game as well. We've been working with Xbox on special behind the scenes things. We've been talking to Arculus about a VR version because everybody asks for a VR version. 
Um, I don't think they realize how much they're going to throw up when they actually try to, uh, to ride a bike in VR. Um, we've got this massive Discord server around the game who are feverish about every single little thing we do. Uh, and, it, and it seems like we're going to make some decent revenue by the end of the year uh, for the game across those two platforms. I mean, the plan then is to bring it to PS4 and Switch and all kinds of things. Uh, so it's gone all right. Um, which is like a massive sigh of relief for me. Can you imagine if I just started my own publishing label and, and bottled it on the first game? Uh, that would have been really awkward. So, um, so when I was putting this talk together, whenever I put talks together like this, uh, I always try to envision like things that you guys are going to want to know. And I know that uh, a lot of the time people want to know about the basics. And I've done loads of talks about the basics, you know, things like, like is listed here, just writing press releases. How do I get YouTubers to care about my game? Uh, how do I get the press to cover it? Does press coverage do anything? What can I do with my Steam page? Um, I decided when putting this talk together that I'm not going to talk about those things because they've been done to death. And again, like I say, by me, if you just go on the GDC vault, uh, which you have access to with your badges, uh, and enter my name, you'll see too many talks from me on these things. Um, so if you want to know about those things, uh, please, it, it's, a lot of that stuff is still super relevant. You can go look that stuff up. What I really decided I wanted to do was talk through when I was setting up No More Robots and when I was trying to decide how to make Descenders sell, uh, the things that were important that I think ended up being massively important to what I did whether I was purposely doing them at the time or not. Um, because I think that everything I'm about to talk about um, is uh, some of it will be, some of it will end up being a little bit vague. Some of it will be, you know, sort of uh, may or may not apply to you. But uh, I think a lot of it is just stuff that when we talk about marketing, we don't really talk about a lot of these things. Um, so anyway, the, the main, so the main six points I'm going to talk about um, the, the one thing that, that rides through all of these things is that I absolutely hate it when I see people saying that it's all about luck. And I've seen people say, well, you just need a bit of magic and all this kind of stuff. I, when, I, when, we, when we were going to announce and release Descenders, uh, I, I knew it was going to sell. That, that might sound egotistical. It might sound like I'm just like bigging myself up. But it's because we had done all of the right things, and we knew how to position it, and we knew what to do with the marketing for the game that at least X number of people were going to buy it. I mean, eventually, more people bought it than we had hoped for, so that was, uh, that was nice. And, you could, and of course, I'm not going to say there's zero luck involved. Of course, there's a sprinkle of luck as well. You know, some games will absolutely explode while other similar games won't do. There's always luck involved in everything, but to say that it's all luck and to say, oh, you know, some of these biggest games, they just they got lucky and this game just was unfortunate. Um, I, I don't believe in that at all. Um, and I, I think that a lot of it is just negating the need for luck, really. Um, so yeah, these six points here, I'm literally just going to go through these things one by one um, and explain exactly what I mean by them and why I think they are super important, especially now. Uh, so number one, um, working out what is exciting about your game. So here's the thing. You think that you know what is exciting about your game, but you are wrong. Okay, <laughs> And that might sound flippant, but I, I, I will honestly bet that at least three quarters of the people in this room who think they know what is exciting about their game are wrong about what is exciting. And if I talk to them about their game, I'd say a thing and they'd say, oh, I hadn't really thought about that as being the exciting thing. Um, what a lot of people do and what I sometimes do as well and have to talk myself out of doing is you, you decide on a thing that is exciting about your game, right? a feature maybe that's exciting about your game. And it is, OK? It is an exciting thing about your game that you think. But it's not forward-facing exciting. It's not like public exciting. It's exciting maybe in a technical standpoint, or it's exciting um, as, a, as an additional thing. But what you actually need is you need the thing that's exciting, and it makes people actually then want to give a crap about your game. Um, 
I always need to have stupid terms for everything. So what I like to call this in my head is the, the hook and the kicker. I, the, the thing that you are thinking in your head is exciting about your game, and maybe the way you've been selling it is probably the kicker. The problem with the kicker is that no one will check that out unless you've hooked them first. You need the, the, the hook first to actually reel them in, Oh, that's a stupid metaphor, isn't it? You, to actually get them, and then you hit them with the other thing that sort of seals the deal. Uh, example, with Descenders, when we were first talking about how to sell the game, we were constantly talking about the procedural stuff in the game. So, it, so the, the whole point in the game is that every single level you ever play in Descenders is procedurally generated uh, from, a, from a, a string, like a seed of numbers. And there's, there's hundreds of millions of levels in this game, right? And the... The, the technical stuff that has gone into making that is honestly incredible, and, and the guys at Rage Squid are just geniuses. Um, but, uh, but, but here's the thing. Uh, if I describe this to you, I don't think that on the spot I would hook you with that. I think you'd be like, oh, that sounds, that sounds pretty impressive. That sounds kind of cool. But from talking and telling people about this, it was obvious to me that it was cool, but it wasn't actually making them remember the game or want to check more stuff out about the game. It turned out that when I just straight up told people it's a downhill mountain biking game, as stupid as that sounds, I'm literally just describing what the game is. That was actually way more interesting to people because they don't know other downhill mountain biking games. There aren't any. And then if I followed that up with, oh, and hey, it's got procedural generated worlds, they, they'd go, well, how does that work? How, how could a bike game have procedural worlds? And then I'd have the conversation. Or then maybe they'd go and check out some more information. Um, without those two things together, uh, they, they complement each other, right? If I just told you it's a downhill mountain biking game, you might be like, oh, cool. If I just tell you it's procedural generation, mm, okay, lots of games are doing that. The two things together work such that you actually come out of the conversation maybe wanting to see some more. Um, this is what you, you need to be trying to find, basically. You need to, that, that line you keep saying to everyone, right? That line that every single time someone asks you, oh, what are you making and what's that game about? Think about that line that you say to people. Is it actually interesting? Like, is it an actual interesting line where if someone said that to you in a bar tonight where you're, you're obviously going to go and do that tonight, when someone does that, are they going to go, oh, what's that? Tell me. I want a card. And, and, or are they going to be like, oh, OK, cool. Do you know if there's anywhere else that has a free bar? So th th this, is, this is honestly the thing. This is, and with every game I'm working with, I'm, I'm tirelessly just trying to work out what is that exciting line that has these two elements in it where I go, it's this cool thing, and by the way, it's this as well, uh, and make them want to read more. Um, it's, 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 it's just one of those things where it's, I honestly feel like this is such a simple point, and yet we just all still get it wrong, right? I still get it wrong. Even when I was first doing Descenders, I was getting this wrong. It's so easy to, to not get this line in, in place in the first place, and you need this. And the thing, the, the thing with this as well is that it can actually then end up just helping you through all of the decisions you make, not just on the marketing side, but on the design side as well, right? Um, it can really help to kind of hone in on, all right, well, what is the game? It's this thing, so these features are the most important thing that we need to be talking about. Um, so uh, yeah, have a real think about this. Um, so once you've got that, uh, let's say you're at the point where you really want to get people interested in your game. Um, the, the main problem I think that a lot of people have at this point is they, uh, you'll, you'll put out a trailer, or you'll put out a website, or anything like that, a press release. Uh, and it might do amazingly. I've seen people put out trailers that have got quarter of a million views. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, the, the problem a lot of the time is that then people, this quarter of a million people watch the trailer, and then they go, oh, that was pretty cool. And then they just go somewhere else on the internet, and your game is forgotten five minutes later. And especially if you're announcing your game, and you know, six months later, you're launching. Six months later, they're not remembering your trailer. They've seen a million other trailers on YouTube. They've seen trailers as ads uh, on YouTube. 
Uh, they're, they're not going to remember your trailer from six months ago. Um, so what are you doing to make sure that when they watch that trailer, they've actually then got somewhere to go and something, you know, it's going to be a small number of people, right? Those quarter of a million people aren't going to want to connect with your game. But even if just 1% of those people want to connect with your game, um, that's a massive number of people who, if you could get them and contain them somewhere, uh, then um, that would be pretty nice. Uh, the answer that I have found uh, is, is as simple as Discord. Uh, I started experimenting with Discord two years ago. Um, I, anybody who knows me knows that I always try to stay on top of the things that I, I think are going to kind of be the next big thing. And Discord at that point was already massive, uh, but it was massive uh, mainly for players. Um, there were some developers on there, but it was, it was a, a great place for, um, for I, mean, I mean, just like IRC and not a crap, it was, it was not a crap Skype, basically. Um, but um, but the, the thing with Discord is that they have a lot of users. I don't know if you know this. They've got like over 100 million registered people on Discord now. Uh, and that is a lot of people. And so uh, I decided, after I'd done a bit of experimenting, uh, I was trying to, uh, when I, at the company I was at before, we were trying to sort of um, collect people together who were excited about our games into a, into a Discord. And it was fine. Uh, we got a, a few hundred people in it, maybe. Um, but uh, but the, the problem I realized very quickly is that if you don't give people an incentive to join some kind of community like that, uh, then they don't. Uh, and it's, um, it, it, it's funny, actually. I, I feel like a lot of the time, there's so many talks and panels and everything on uh, how, do you, how do you look after a community? How do you maintain a community? No one ever does a talk or a panel on how do you start a community? How do I get the people in the first place? Um, and that is the big question. And it turns out the answer is give them free stuff. Uh, magic, I know. Uh, so, so I decided uh, I would try and do this. I would try and give them a bunch of actual reasons to join a Discord. So when we announced Descenders last year, I said, look, if you want to be part of the closed beta for Descenders, you have to join the Discord. Uh, I had no idea at that point how I was actually going to get them in the beta. I just wanted them in a Discord. Um, so I did that. What I also did um, was that uh, I decided that wasn't enough, and I needed to build some kind of meta game. Uh, I, I should say, by the way, I've just realized I keep talking about Discord as if you all know what it is. It just in case there's people in the room who, who aren't aware, uh, Discord is um, essentially like another one of those chat programs, right, where people can join servers, and they can make channels, and they can do voice chat, and they can do text chat. Um, it's not that Discord did anything crazy different to all the others. It's just that they did it in very clever ways. And they got a bit lucky as well. Uh, and they've got lovely people working there as well, which always helps. Um, so uh, OK, we're up to speed on what Discord is now. So what I decided to try and do was create a game in the Descenders Discord that people would then want to play before Descenders came out. Uh, so that's what I did. I made it so that when someone joined the Descenders Discord, they couldn't see any channels except this one channel called Pick a Side. And in the game, there's three teams. And I made it so that before they could ac ac uh, access anything in the Discord, they had to pick one of these three teams out of the game. And it gave them all the information about these three teams, but it told them, once you've done it, <laughs> you can't change again. Uh, and they pick a side, and then it would open up the rest of the Discord and give them special channels as well. And it would also change the color of their name to the color of that team in the game and put them in this like tribe mentality. And then we started pitting them off against each other each week, doing community challenges. Uh, who can do the best fan art? Who can come up with the best this, the best that? Um, and uh, this stuff made people stick around because uh, they, even though they had no idea how the game played yet, and they wouldn't for another six months, uh, they, um, they desperately wanted to win every week, and they wanted to. We, we, we uh, made it so that um, they'd get special emotes, or emojis, I don't know what you call them. Uh, you, we'd, we'd get special ones of those each week, depending on which team won. Um, 
And uh, all of this, I mean, it took some work. I, I'll, I'll admit, it, it, was a, it was a lot of, um, and I learned a lot about community management very quickly uh, because about 5,000 people ended up joining in a very short space of time. Um, but, but here's the thing, when we got to the launch of the game, those were thousands of people who were super into not just the game, but us as well, because they had this direct line to us. And they were, at, by this point, there was all sorts of memes that they'd made around us, the developers, myself, uh, because they felt like they had this super close connection to us. In fact, when we launched the game, we launched it 20 minutes early and only told the Discord server. And then I realized the launch discount hadn't been applied uh, it wasn't going to be applied for another 20 minutes. So I said in Discord, oh, just, just wait 20 minutes, the launch discount will happen. And we sold like 1,000 copies of the game just in the first 20 minutes because Discord people were so adamant they needed the game right now that they didn't care about the 10% discount. Um, when you have a community base like that that is already prepped and ready when the game is going to come out, that is a useful tool to have. Uh, and the cool thing is as well, they're still there now, and they're causing the uh, they're causing like the the long tail of the game uh, to go on even longer. I've I've launched many games that I've never seen. You know, normally it's like up here for the launch, and then uh, this game has has been like this. It's it's continuing to sell because these people are bringing their friends in, and um, it's it's honestly it's it's been one of the the craziest things I have. Um, out of everything I've uh, kind of put together for making a game sell, it's one of the things that has worked the, the most well. Um, apart from like having a great day one sales, um, we've had a, a lot of um, situations as well which I hadn't uh, sort of envisioned were going to occur. So for example, all of these people just desperately wanted to give us positive Steam reviews immediately as well. So within like a day, we had like a, we had like a, a 94% positive rating on Steam because they'd all plowed it with positive Steam reviews. Whenever someone would leave a negative Steam review, people from the community would comment on it, trying to help them, and then end up flipping negative Steam reviews into positive ones. And I didn't have to do anything to make that happen. These people just did it themselves. Um, uh, and a lot of people, if, if people had problems, they had bug reports and all this kind of stuff, they came in the Discord. We've got a channel called Bug Reporting. They could go in there. All the bug reports are right there. They're not clogging up the Steam forums where it just, you know, obviously normally Steam forums just look like, you know, hell basically. Uh, so it, it kind of helped clean up that place as well. Um, I don't work for Discord, honestly. I know it looks like I do. I'm just, I, I honestly, I, it's honestly one of the, 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 most, uh, the most brilliant things that has happened um, for people selling games, I think, now that, that there is now this centralized place where you can collect people together. But like I say, you just got to make sure that you actually give them a reason to do that. Um, now, what I want to talk about here was, uh, uh, was streaming. So uh, I've done many talks about streaming in the past, and streaming is obviously still an important thing. It's more important than ever, maybe. Um, so, so here's the thing about streaming. Um, it used to be, you know, like a couple of years ago, a few years ago, you try and get big streamers to play your game, right? Uh, and then someone big will play your game, and you get a nice spike. YouTubers as well. We'll kind of talk about YouTubers with this as well. Um, what you need to know now is that that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, for Descenders, uh, not even for the last year, it hasn't been happening, and anybody who's launched a game in the last year and maybe has had a big YouTuber or streamer will know that there's just no spike at all anymore. Uh, you know, we've, we've, had, we've had pretty much every single massive streamer play Descenders in the last month, and we'll have an okay day that day. You know, it might be elevated slightly, but there's no spikes at all. Uh, people watch streamers and YouTubers for the streamers and YouTubers now. They don't watch, they don't, they don't make purchasing decisions based off you know, media. It, I mean, it might be that they watch multiple YouTubers or streamers, see your game multiple times, and then when it's on a 25% sale go, oh, I remember Lyric playing that. Maybe I'll pick that up now. That, that's possible, but you don't get the immediate, Lyric is playing this game, I need to own this game thing anymore. That doesn't happen. So if you are trying to base a, uh, marketing around that, do not. Uh, I wouldn't even, I used to suggest that people do um, uh, 
uh, you know, sort of do uh, Twitch integration and, you know, chat integration and special, like, Twitch games and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you are going to do that stuff, don't spend a long time on it, I would honestly suggest, uh, because I don't think you're going to see much in return. Uh, do it as, like, a cool little side thing, maybe. Uh, but, yeah, I, I honestly don't think it's um, worth putting the effort in anymore. Now, the reason why I've listed Mixer here, uh, and I'll explain what Mixer is, because I'm, uh, I'm discovering this week that not as many people have heard of Mixer. So Mixer is, uh, is, is an, another streaming platform. I think it used to be called Beam. Uh, and uh, it's, it's owned by uh, Microsoft. And Mixer, um, Mixer's definitely smaller than Twitch. Um, but Mixer is interesting because it is essentially Twitch three or four years ago. It's kind of, it's, it's growing rapidly and it's having a lot of resources put into it. And because of that, uh, it's very difficult to get any traction on Twitch anymore because Twitch is very focused streamers, right? And now the front page is always these massive streamers and starting off as a new person, it can be very difficult to get some traction on Twitch. Mixer, it's a lot easier to do that now. And it's especially a lot easier for developers because uh, even though, um, as far as I can tell, Microsoft aren't screaming so much about this, uh, they, on, on the Mixer platform, they're very much supporting developers a lot. I, I started talking to, to the, the team there uh, and they said, they, they, I, I had no idea they were doing this. They said to me, oh, yeah, we can give you a developer account on Mixer. And I was like, OK, yeah, sure, you do that. And I got a little verified tick on there. And then the next time I streamed, I went front page on Mixer. And they just feature developers on, on the front page of Mixer just by you being a developer and you streaming on Mixer, because that to them is like you supporting their platform over the other bigger ones. Um, and I mean, in the last, I've been streaming Descenders uh, every single day for the last month, and I've had like over 200,000, nearly a quarter of a million people watch these streams, which is bigger numbers than I was even getting on Twitch. Um, and uh, and it, especially if you've got a game coming out on Xbox as well, it's amazing because the, the streams, the front page streams, appear on the Xbox dashboard as well. So when I'm on a stream and I say, Hey, is anyone from Xbox watching? The chat goes crazy. And uh, we're, we're aiming to have Descenders out in roughly about May. Uh, so I, this, is, this has been a massive thing for me. I've got all of these uh, eyeballs from, from Xbox players where normally it can be quite difficult to specifically get people who play on Xbox, right? You just hope they read some press or they look at a forum. Now I have a direct line to people who are, uh, who are playing on Xbox and they're watching my game on Xbox. And they're saying, oh, this seems really cool. I'll buy it. And I'm saying, yeah, please do. Um, so uh, so if, if, you're, if you're releasing a game on Xbox, 100% get on this. If you're not, there's still, I, I would still heavily suggest uh, that you get in touch with Mixer. They, they, they have been, honestly, nothing but, <coughs> but amazing, really. Um, all right. So this one. Uh, this one I find massively important, but I'm going to have to explain it very well. I think that the I think a good number of people um, don't do a very good job of the way that they actually um, give off a vibe about their game. Uh, and what I mean about that is that the way that your game is shown in public and the way that people perceive it will eventually determine how much value they think. I know this sounds horrible. I know this is the kind of word you don't want to hear, right? But you've got to think about these things. Is the way people perceive the actual value of your game, and when it launches, whether or not they think, oh, am I going to buy it in a sale, or could I not be bothered? Because we hear this all the time right now, that people don't buy games at launch. They just wait for sales. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with this image you do for your game. So. For example, and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this chart now, right? This chart here is a thing that is in my head uh, that I'm going to have to explain. And I have, I have had this in my head for like a year now. Uh, and it might make no sense, but it makes perfect sense in my brain. So I'm going to try to explain it to you. I think that there are three different categories of the perception that people have of games in their head. People, when they look at games, they immediately, just from about a trailer, they watch a trailer and they immediately in their head 
put it into one of these three things. They either decide that's an indie game, or they decide, oh, that's, I call it double A, but you know, lots of people have, it, it's the, the mid tier essentially, right? And then they've got, oh, that's a triple A game. And the, and it's, it's really, I, I think it's really important to know not just which one you fall into, but then also to know what that means for your game. <clears throat> I talk to a lot of developers um, who are either pricing their game wrong or they have what I believe is like a double A game, but they're treating it like it's an indie game. Um, when, I, when I was first talking to the Rage Squid guys uh, about Descenders, like, they were showing it to me and, and they, were saying, um, they were saying, oh, we, we think we can probably uh, charge about $15 for it and we'll, uh, you know, we'll try and get on some of the indie sites and all this kind of stuff. And um, I thought they were mad because the thing that I was looking at, I was looking at this and, and saying to them, what are you talking about? This is, this is not a perceived indie game that you have here. This is what people would perceive as a double A game. This is, this is the kind of game where people would see a trailer for this and they would think, Oh, I'd, I'd pay a bit of money for this. And I remember when we launched the original trailer for the game, there was YouTube comments saying, I'd only pay $40 for this. And it's, it's that kind of thing, and they, and they couldn't believe it. Um, I mean, eventually we've ended up uh, charging $25 for it, and we have had no, quite, like we've had barely any people saying this game is too expensive. Um, it's really important to know where you are on this. If uh, a lot of the time, you'll just know, right? A lot of the time, you know with your game whether it is going to be classed as indie in people's eyes. Uh, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, the, the next game I'm announcing next week, I believe, is going to be perceived as indie. Um, but then, uh, it's, it's when people are in between this indie and AAA one, they're at the top of the indie one, and they could actually move on to the next one and have this whole new audience it's that where uh, you really need to think where exactly you are on these because it can make a massive difference for you. It can make an absolute massive difference. Um, I think being perceived as, as a double A game has helped us in lots of ways with Descenders. Um, and uh, and it, is, it has directed the way that I sell the game. Uh, I'm gonna, the, nec the next game I'm, I'm announcing, which is more of an indie title, I'm definitely gonna be selling it in very different ways to the way I've been selling Descenders because of this perception, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it might not seem that important to you, but please have a think about where you fall on this. Um, so I said earlier that uh, I do not like relying on luck. Um, I think that anybody who tells you everything is luck-based uh, is wrong, and you need to put everything in place to make sure that when your game comes out, you're not just uh, sitting there and hoping and praying this is gonna sell, which I think is what the vast majority of people, I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who have released games on Steam and have sat on launch day and said like, hope people think it's cool. Um, it's, the, it's the wrong thing to do. You used to be able to get away with that. You can't anymore. You absolutely can't anymore. Um, so the Discord stuff I was talking about was a perfect example of making sure that you are reducing the risk. You, we knew when Descenders launched, we could see the numbers, we could see how many people were active in our Discord. We could see, we could see exactly, well, not exactly, but roughly, how many people were at least going to buy it in week one. Um, things like uh, Steam wish lists. Uh, it's, it's, kinda, it's kind of common fact now that you normally, in your first month, sell, your, your wish list kind of convert somewhere around between 7% and 12%, somewhere around that. So if you are building Steam wish lists and you get to 30,000 wish lists, then you know that, that in the first month, you are most likely, unless your game for some reason doesn't match this model at all, which you know, I, I guess it can, depend on, um, it can depend on the quality of the game, but uh, you would hope to at least be converting those into about 3,000 people. It's, it's this kind of thing where it's, 
it, it's horrible, but it's all a numbers game. If you have the numbers when the day of your, you know, the, the, the launch day comes, and you know that at least X number of these people are going to buy it, you can then use that to flow into more people. If you're completely just relying on, oh, I hope people see the game on launch day, um, that is, um, it's really bad news. Um, the other thing you can do is try to get as many uh, people involved who are influential and try to get them to put skin in the game. Uh, what I mean by that is that you have to do that horrible thing that no one likes doing, where you just start really doing all of those horrible, horrible, cringy things. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you know the kind of things that I'm talking about, the things like, uh, for example, um, just trying to talk to every single person possible. And it, it, it's funny, whenever I, um, whenever I tell somebody, for example, that uh, I have uh, a, a tweet deck set up that has multiple columns where I'm tracking, just looking for the word descenders, looking for the word rage squid, looking for this, looking for that. And whenever someone tweets within like five minutes, I'm tweeting back at them, I'm DMing them, I'm sending them this, I'm sending them that. People, uh, some people react really badly to that and they say, oh, it's a bit much that, isn't it? It's a bit weird that you're doing that. It's like, it's a bit creepy in a way that you're just sort of, you're kind of uh, watching over anybody who ever mentions your game. Uh, doing that sells games. So you should do it. Um, even if it makes you feel all weird inside and horrible, um, if someone, the, the, I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen someone tweet about Descenders saying, oh, this seems pretty cool. Don't know if I'll pick it up, though. And I tweeted back at them just saying something like, oh, well, thanks for saying that. That was really nice. It's, it's cool that you considered it. And then they've tweeted a screenshot back at me saying, oh, it's really cool you tweeted at me. I bought it now. That singular tweet just, just made us another $25. And, and it, it, it blows my mind how often that happens, especially with like streamers. I see a streamer saying, yo, I've seen this Descenders games around, and I'll immediately just DM them a key. I won't even ask. I'll just get in their DMs, and I will send them a Steam key, and then tweet at them saying, yo, you've got a Steam key in your, uh, in your DMs now. And they'll, they're like, they'll, they'll all of a sudden, in the next two minutes, I'll see, I can just imagine them at home just like being like, what? <laughs> they, just, they, they just follow me and then they say, oh my God, thank you so much. And that evening they're playing the game. Uh, it's, it's, it wasn't that much effort for me to do that. Uh, it helps that I enjoy doing that. I must stress like I'm a weirdo and I enjoy doing all of this stuff. I appreciate there'll be lots of people in this room who are just like, I do not have time for that. That sounds so boring. Um, but um, doing these awful things uh, I feel like there's a reason why we, we find them awful. Um, and sometimes you just got to grit your teeth. Uh, f another one, just emailing people, asking for stuff. People hate doing that. Every single deal or anything I have put in place for Descenders, I emailed multiple people asking for stuff until they got back to me. Uh, everything with Xbox, I emailed, uh, I emailed Xbox over and over and over again, sending them this, sending them that, sending them builds of the game, being like, well, can I meet you? Can I? And setting things up, showing them face to face that I meant business with this thing. And then every single time I see even a minor opportunity, I'm jumping all over it. And you know, a year later, now Xbox are like, okay, well, it seems like maybe uh, he's going to be able to make this sell on Xbox, so maybe we should um, you know, support him quite well. Uh, and this has happened multiple times. Uh, we've, we've done stuff with NVIDIA, all the stuff we've been doing with Discord. Obviously, uh, I've been then trying to, uh, after I've got into Discord, talk to those guys. Uh, again, with Mixer, me just emailing them and saying, like, hey, is there stuff I can do on Mixer? And them coming back, and now, just because I asked, um, I'm, I'm getting hundreds of thousands of views on Mixer, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just asked. Um, asking is hard, I know. I know it can feel really hard to just, because a lot of the time it's like imposter syndrome, right? You, you feel like, they're not gonna care about my game. They don't care about who I am. Uh, don't go into it thinking that, because the thing you're making is super important. 
Uh, and if you, if, if you truly feel like it's this massively important thing to you, go and show other people it's important as well. Go and talk to everybody and ask for things. Um, the vast majority of the time when I just ask for free stuff, people give me free stuff because I guess people find it hard to say no. Um, so uh, really, just, just honestly do it. You'll, you'll, you'll be surprised at how far it can get you just emailing people and asking for stuff. Um, the final thing uh, after all of this uh, is to just be realistic. Uh, so again, these are numbers from my talk yesterday. Uh, the average game on Steam is making about $30,000 uh, in its first year now. So what you need to be doing is you need to be imagining if my game makes $30,000 in the first year, which is entirely plausible, what am I going to do about it? Or what can I do right now to be able, for this to be OK, essentially? Um, so I mean, there's, it, it's, it's a tricky one, right? There's no easy answer to this. There's, uh, there's, plenty of, um, there's plenty of things you can, you can consider. Um, you don't want to, you know, there's, there's certain things on this list that you don't just want to hobble into your game. You don't just want to go, well, we'll probably run out of money here. And if we're only going to make that much money, let's just do early access. Uh, early access obviously makes sense for certain types of games and not other ones. Um, multiple platforms. Uh, is, is a massive thing I keep telling people. Like, a lot of people just don't think that they're going to be able to get access to Xbox dev kits, uh, or they're not going to be able to find someone to help them port, that kind of stuff. Xbox uh, give away free dev kits. They literally will send you two free dev kits. All you have to do is just sign up your game with them, and they do that. Um, uh, or at least they do in Europe. I'm, say, I'm talking as if uh, I know what happens in America, but um, if, you, if you're in Europe, that's what they do. Um, and uh, there's, there's plenty of people around as well um, who, who are, are throwing funding into this. There's, there's loads of um, local things. Again, I'm talking from UK perspective here, unfortunately. But as far as I understand, there's lots over here as well. Um, uh, all that said and done, if uh, if $30,000 in the first year isn't going to be enough for, to support yourself or a team, uh, then you, you absolutely should have that horrible conversation of, uh, is this sustainable for, for us to be doing this full time? Um, and, and if it's not, then what do I do, essentially? Um, but it, it would be... It's, it's, a, it's just a very bad idea to not consider all this stuff. I know it's grim, and I know it's very, like, ugh, just a horrible way to kind of get to the end of this thing. But you do need to think about this stuff. Uh, otherwise, um, you could just you could get caught out in, in just a horrible way. I, I've, I've seen too many developers put everything into a release, and then it's maybe not gone as well as they're hoping. And then they've realized, oh, god, I've got no plan. And uh, obviously, you get massively depressed whether after a game launch, whether it's done well or not. Uh, so you don't particularly want uh, a double whammy um, of badness happening. <laughs> um, right, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I promise. I know I've talked forever. Um, this is, this is if, if you just want a too long didn't read or if you fell asleep a little bit and checked your phone a little bit during that, I don't blame you. Uh, here are. Uh, the important points. Uh, I mean, the main ones, the, the main things I would honestly say that have worked amazingly for the Descenders launch, the Discord stuff I was talking about, the, the Mixer stuff I was talking about, getting all the deals in place with, um, with Xbox, even just, um, just getting those guys to, to help us out has been amazing. Uh, and then really, just unfortunately just doing the legwork, just gritting your teeth and really doing this stuff. Uh, I appreciate there'll be lots of people in here as well who uh, just don't have the time to do a lot of this stuff or just don't want to because it's boring. Um, if you are one of those people, that's fair enough. I would suggest then you find someone to do it for you. Um, 
put it this way, right? If you work with a publisher or someone like that, yeah, they're going to take a cut of your game. But what is worse, right? <laughs> a 100% a, a of a small number or 70% of, of a large number? Uh, you, you really need to weigh up whether or not you need someone involved in doing this stuff because it's so important. And if you don't do it, there is um, a high chance that, unfortunately, uh, your game isn't going to, to do as well as you would have hoped. Uh, I feel like I've ended on a, a really um, down tone. I should, have, I should have prepared a joke for this part, but whatever, that's all you're getting. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, God, I talked forever, didn't I? I? I think I have like four minutes left if anybody wants to ask a question. There's microphones here and here. Uh, I would love questions. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, so first of all, thanks for the talk. That was awesome. And your previous one yesterday was also very informative. I was wondering if, um, so you talked about Steam wishlist um, as a way to uh, use it as a KPI um, or a, pr a predictive measure. So I was wondering um, if there's any other KPIs that you keep your eyes out um, for and any other ways of seeing, basically measuring success um, or predicting a measure of success and whether you've, uh, with uh, your, um, with No More Robots, whether you've uh, seen a scenario where you have those KPIs and a title that's just not meeting them and that you've had to can or change the strategy. Um. So I, get, like, I guess the obvious one, I feel like I keep saying this over and over again, but I feel like, the, like a big obvious one for us was the Discord stuff. We, we could see exactly how many people were in the server, how many people were active in the server, and we could see as well just how many people were feverish in the server as well. So uh, we were pretty confident at the kinds of numbers that were going to convert from people who were in our Discord uh, to sales there. And we kind of coupled that with wish lists as well. Um, but uh, I, I wish I had, um, I wish I'd started the mixer stuff earlier as well, to be honest. I wish that I'd gotten on that because I feel like that would have uh, given us a massive bump. Um, a lot of the stuff was just centralized around those places. Uh, there's, uh, there's obviously, there's, there's plenty of other ones, but uh, these were the ones that I felt like uh, I could really core focus on. Uh, and that wouldn't just grind us into the ground. I, 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 to clarify, I love looking at numbers. And I love like working out all of these things. But I think uh, you you just end up um, you you just end up getting a little too into these kind of things, don't you? And you you start to see numbers in your sleep a little bit if you if you start to worry too much about this stuff. So um, yeah, that was enough for me, really. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, thanks again for the pair of talks. No worries. Very, very good I hope good it wasn't stuff. too rambly. I felt like it was quite rambly, it but was, It was the right amount so of ramble. Like Don't worry. I'll tell you. Um, anyway, sorry. So I have a question about you kind of touched on giving off the right vibe when it came to your game. Mm. And one of the main things that you focused on was a price point. Yeah. What else goes into that? Um, so uh, I... I think that in general, people price their games too low. I've, I've been seeing developers all day, and pretty much every single developer I've talked to today, I've told them that they're pricing, you know, like everybody puts in their little kind of deck, don't they? Like, we reckon at a, a launch price of $10 or $15. And pretty much every single person I've talked to today, I've said, you could charge more than that, by the way, you know? Like, and um, a lot of it comes down to um, things like uh, genre uh, and, um, it, for, for Descenders, when we, when we announced Descenders, we were hoping that we were giving off the right vibe. And when it turned out we were, and we started to get comments like, I wouldn't pay $40 for this, yeah. that was a pretty good set. That gave us a good sense right, of what kind of price we could charge. I honestly, looking back, feel like we could have charged more than $25 for it at this point, And we, we maybe could have pushed it to 30 but. Um, but that, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's by the by. But um, a, a lot of the time, I would suggest to people when they're trying to decide on the price to, uh, to take what kind of game they've got, look at all the other games that are coming out on Steam right now, but specifically look at which ones are 
doing, um, doing well with not like the massive ones. You kind of you should cut those ones out because they're all you know kind of miracle workers. When you look at sort of the mid-tier games, which are doing pretty well, they're making you know sort of half a mil for themselves uh, in the first month. Um, a lot of the time, those games will be will surprise you. They'll be priced a little bit higher uh, than you think. Uh, I, I saw a um, I saw a strategy game today, and uh, the the guys making that said they were thinking, oh, they reckon they could get fifteen dollars for that. I said to them, I bet you could get $25 for this. Strategy games on Steam right now sell well. Like a lot of the time, strategy games, because it's very niche and it's very PC gamer. Um, if you look at the prices of those kind of games, uh, they, they are priced higher um, because cause people who play those kind of games don't mind paying a little bit more. They're, they are like hardcore PC, PC gamers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's doing a, just a lot of research and really asking yourself, can, can, I, can I ask for a bit more? And remember as well, the people who you've gathered around the game before the launch, they'd honestly pay anything. Like, and and that's, that's not to say you, know, you should exploit them or anything like that, but it's more like you dropping the price, you going, oh, I'll drop the price by $5 just in case. They don't care. They absolutely don't care. Like I told you, that all these people bought our game when it didn't even have the launch discount on it. They just want to play it. Um, so, so why discount it by, by? If people weren't going to buy it at launch, that extra five, $5 off, is it really going to pull them in? Um, and yet, adding an extra $5 onto your price, it sounds like a tiny amount, but you sell a, an extra 10,000 copies of your game. You, like for a lot of people, that that could be like a whole extra year's worth of, of living. So, you know, it's um, it seems like small numbers, but I think it's honestly really, really important to think hard about it. Okay, thank you very much. Cool. Hello. Hi, yes, thanks for the talk. Um, in regards to developing a community pre-release, do you have any like insight as to what's the best time frame for that in terms of, you know, not doing it so early that you risk losing interest versus so late yeah, that yeah. no time to grow? Yeah, I, I, think, uh, <clears throat> I think we announced uh, Descenders too early. Okay. Um, we, we announced it in July last year and then it came out in February. Um, which is seven months. Yeah. What is that like? Seven, seven months, months yeah. or something like that. Um, I I I think that was too long. It it felt like it dragged a little bit, mm -hmm. and I wonder if we lost some people along the way uh, because it felt like it was too long. Um, we split that time up a little bit with the community, uh, you know, the weekly community stuff, uh, and with uh, we ran a a closed beta for the mm -hmm. Discord people in October. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I would honestly say six months is the months. longest year. I, I think that between announcement of a game and actually launching a game, the sweet spot is somewhere between three and six months. Okay. Yeah, Sometimes definitely. depending on what your game actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's enough, it's a decent amount of time where you can build up a little community, but you're always telling them it's coming very mm -hmm. soon, I promise. It's coming very soon uh, and not have them disappear too quickly. Uh, okay, all right, thank you, that was very helpful. No worries. Hello. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, you touched on uh, YouTubers and Twitch streamers don't really convert well to game sales. They're mostly there for free entertainment. Mm. Um, what is your view on uh, media outlets and previews and reviews? Do you see a bigger tick from those kind of uh, coverage? Uh, no, no, I, not, not for a long time, to be honest. I, I was giving talks about this uh, years ago where I was saying um, that the press don't really do much for for us like uh, uh, just to clarify it's still well worth getting press to talk about your game and getting youtubers and streamers and everybody just because they don't do spikes doesn't mean they aren't causing i i think that uh descenders has plateaued at a nice amount number of sales per per day um thanks to thanks to all the coverage because now when someone if someone sees it and they they search for the word descenders they see all of these articles talking about it, they see it on this website, that website, and I think that, that helps to sell it um, to anybody who's coming along. But uh, no, I, I, not for years, to be honest, have I seen any sort of spikes out of um, specific press kind of talking about my game. Gotcha, so. thanks. The, a, an interesting thing, actually, is that, um, is that when we announced Descenders, um, we, we ended up getting about, I think, like 125,000 views on the trailer, like in the first month. 
uh, about 40,000 of those came from, from, from Games Press, mm -hmm. uh, and about 85,000 of those came from Bike Press, <laughs> uh, and that was about two outlets. Gotcha. Um, Go for the bike press is what you're saying. Get, so just get in contact with the bike press. Yeah. Um, <laughs> confuse them. I don't know. Put a bike in your game. <laughs> Worked for us. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hey there. Um, so earlier in your talk, well, thank you for giving this talk, by the way. Um, no let's see. Uh, earlier in your talk, you talked about uh, like asking. Uh, asking a lot for like partnerships and stuff like that. It seems like you took a pretty fearless approach and coming from a Northwesterner, the problem that I find in simply just asking for things is that yep. there's a ton of perception around what the response might be. Yep. So then my question to you is, would you prefer just recklessly asking for things b because you don't know what might happen or would you prefer a more tempered approach depending on the type of game that you have? Well, what's the worst thing that could happen if you ask though? Like you, if you if you if you ask someone if you go to someone and say, I I want this. Can can we work together on this thing? The worst that's going to happen is they're going to ignore you, or you're never going to burn a bridge or anything by asking someone for help. Uh, the the worst that's going to happen is you'll feel a bit shit <laughs> because someone didn't get back to you. The best that's going to happen is they're going to say, All right, cool. Let's jump on a call, and I'll hmm. and I'll suss you out. And at that point, you've you've got a window. Um, you're right, I do, I, I do, uh, I, I, I can be a bit reckless with all this kind of stuff, but it, it, I think it works, to be honest. I think, um, I think people actually appreciate a direct approach sometimes. I, I guess reckless was a little bit too, uh, too reckless. Um, yeah. I would say more courageous, I guess, forward thinking, I guess. I'm, I'm struggling for words here. <laughs> no, I, no, it, it's like I was saying, I, I, I honestly, uh, I, I think um, I think it's one of my personality pro points that ah. I feel okay doing this. All the stuff I was talking about, you know, doing the horrible, like <laughs> cringy stuff as well. For some reason, at some point in my life, I decided I didn't care. Um, I appreciate that a lot of uh, real human beings <laughs> with actual emotions uh, find this stuff hard and find it hard to just ask. Um, just get over it. Just honestly, just ask. Because, <laughs> like I say, everything that happens, you make happen. No one has been coming to me, get, you know, trying to uh, just being like, hey, can we help you with the success of Descenders? I have asked and asked and asked and made every little thing happen by asking. Um, so just, just, just do it. Just try it. Just try it. Just grit your teeth and try it. Start asking for stuff. If it doesn't work out for you, ignore me and go back to not asking for stuff. But just, <laughs> just for a month. Just for a month. Just try it. What could happen? For a month. Um, just, just try asking for things. See how it goes. Um, and if you hate it, fine. <laughs> but maybe it'll change your life. For, I feel like this is turning into some kind of life seminar now. <laughs> go be um, you, man. Yeah. <laughs> you can do this. Uh, yeah. That is what I would say. All right, cool. Do it, is, is what <laughs> I think Sheila Booth said. Um, I guess before I give the mic over to the uh, next person, uh, you mentioned earlier about you know, getting dev kits. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say can confirm, because um, I had a pretty epic freak out when I, like the game that, I, that I'm working on managed to somehow become a part of ID at Xbox, and I had a pretty epic freak out when they showed up at my door. Yeah. Because um, I thought, where But then there'll be loads of people who, 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 uh, who don't ask that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so like, and, and how easy was it? It was... It, uh, it was actually pretty easy. Yeah, I mean, you had to fill out a bunch of horrible forms, right? Because you can't get anything like that without filling out a whole bunch of forms. But you, you did the horrible form filling out, and then this thing turned up. And then two giant white boxes showed yeah. up at the door. Yeah, they're pretty big. <laughs> uh, cheers. <laughs> Hello. Hey, just echoing previous sentiments. I was at the talk yesterday, really enjoyed yeah. it. Wasn't planning to be back, but here I am, so thank you very much. No um, and so you mentioned all the benefits of a Discord community. It, you sort of sold me on it, but having not seen your previous talks, I still feel sort of unclear on how you got that initial bunch of people to be there. Um, what in are the, the steps involved in that? And if it's your previous uh, talks. Yeah, maybe I didn't at. explain that well enough. So, so, um, so what I was trying to say was that uh, you, you need to give people a reason to be joining the Discord. And uh, the way you do that is that you tell them that to get this free stuff you're going to give them, they have to join the Discord. The free stuff for us was doing a closed beta 
uh, through the Discord. So we, from the moment we announced the game, we said we were going to do a closed beta very soon. And we said that the way to do that was to sign up in the Discord. The, the press reported on that. Uh, and uh, a lot of those people, uh, do I have to stop? One more question. One more question. OK, cool. Um, and uh, a lot of those, uh, a lot of people then, if they read the article on a press website and were interested in it, they'd then click the link to the Discord. People fall away, right? Because most people won't click the link to the Discord in the first place. And then of those people, most people don't have Discord. So you end up only getting a small funnel of people. But even so, a small funnel of people for us was thousands of people. But you got the word out through traditional press outlets and things like exactly, that. Exactly, yeah. Gotcha. And then around about the time we were doing the closed beta as well, you know, in the like couple of weeks we announced the date for the closed beta, we got another surge of like a couple of extra thousand people back into the Discord again because we said, this thing's coming out for free in two weeks. Here's how you get it. And another bunch of people um, came in. So um, yeah, it's surprisingly easy to get people to kind of want to be part of your community if you're throwing free stuff at them. It's Thank you very up. much. Who knew? Uh, hi. Apparently, we only have one more question. So I'll try and make it a good one. It better be great. It better be great. <laughs> you mentioned uh, finding a publisher or other partner to do the uh, annoying and or cringy work. Yeah. Uh, do you know anyone who's interested in publishing games? And if, or more generally, suggestions for finding and connecting with those sorts of people? Yeah. I mean, um, when it comes to that kind of stuff, everybody's looking for different things. Um, the, the main thing that I'd say is if you're, if you're working with a publisher, make sure that you're getting a good deal, to be honest. Uh, well, one, of the, uh, one of the main reasons why I did set up my own thing, and in fact why it's called No More Robots, is because over and over and over again, people were telling me when they work with you know, indie publishers or whatever you want to call them, uh, they, you know, they'd sign up, they'd maybe not sign, uh, they'd sign a deal which was maybe not great. And then they'd never talk to that person ever again who signed them because now they were passed along to a, another part of the company. And, and then they, it was like, OK, cool, we'll hear from you in six months then when you've got the build ready, and then we'll push it out. And um, it's. Uh, uh, if you're going to work with a publisher, uh, do some heavy scoping of them, basically. Talk to, email every single dev who has worked with them and say, what's it like to work with this person? Because uh, you don't want to, it can be exciting, right, if someone's showing interest in your work and is saying, hey, let's work together. We'll take this, this revenue share and, and then we'll put it, and it might sound amazing, but then when you sign with them, you realize, oh, crap. Like, they're not doing anything and they're the worst. Uh, I, I hear that all the time. Um, and uh, it, it can easily be uh, remedied by just making sure that you email people who have published with them before and saying, are they OK? Are they cool? And if they say, no, then you don't, uh, because it's, it's <laughs> never worth selling your soul. <laughs> uh, did that answer your question? Pretty much. OK. Good. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.